we are going to be commencing the first session that is devoted to the major uh, issue is how to keep the peace. And I would like to invite global mediator, former prime minister of uh, Portugal and um, chairman of Global Alliance for Women and Immunization. Hello, Hello. Belfast. How are you? Can you hear us? Yes, can I, hear, I can hear you. Can you see me well? Or can we, can, I... we can see you very well. Is it better like that or, or is it better like that? I think the curtains should be shut, shut down, yeah. Shut, yeah, it's better, better shut, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The problem, I'm not in a very good area. But okay, like that, it's better? Yes, that looks fantastic. Okay, Mr. Barroso, if you're ready, um, I'd like to start. And uh, today, I mean, the world is witnessing harrowing images of civilian casualties and mass destruction in cities and towns of Ukraine and alarming news of atro atrocities on the ground. So today we will be focusing um, on um, Russia-Ukraine conflict and crisis, uh, especially with your expertise in the area. Uh, we won't be talking about the events of the day, but we'd like to see, to understand the bigger picture and sort of examine the larger context. Um, you were the head of the European Commission during the Russo-Georgian War in 2008, uh, during the Crimean crisis of 2014, and you know more than anyone that Moscow has been adamant about it viewing NATO's eastward expansion as an existential threat. Still, did you ever think that the conflict would escalate to the level that it has now, to the scale and in the manner that it has in the past few weeks, in the past seven weeks? What is your initial reaction? So, first of all, let me tell you it's indeed a pleasure to be in your very important event, Nobel Fest, and to share my experience. Um, as you rightly said, I have been engaged in some of these issues for a long time because I was president of the European Commission uh, when uh, we negotiated the uh, association agreement with Ukraine and also uh, during the conflict with Georgia. And we had also a very extensive and deep relationship with Russia. Uh, I met uh, President Putin, uh, according to my office, 25 times. Uh, it was the non-European Union leader I met the most because before the annexation of Crimea, uh, we had twice a year uh, summits between the European Union and uh, Russia. At that time, we uh, were considering each other a strategic partner. And also, uh, I met him when he was president the first time, then uh, when he was prime minister, uh, he came to Brussels, I went to Moscow, and also I met him again when he was president again of, of Russia. So, indeed, many, many interactions with uh, Russia, with Ukraine, and other, and Georgia, and other countries in the region. So, I'm extremely sad uh, with the events uh, now in Ukraine. And what I can tell you is that, uh, of course, I remain a very committed European, but at the same time, I remain very committed to peace, peace in Europe and peace in the world. Now, I was uh, not expecting the scale of war and conflict we are now witnessing. This to answer your question directly. I was expecting, frankly, some conflicts in some of these areas uh, after the next of Crimea. Uh, I was expecting some. Uh, and in fact, I've been saying that for some time, uh, including I have written about it. But frankly, I did not expect a full-scale invasion. Frankly, this is not a, only a special mol, mon, uh, military operation. It is a huge invasion of Ukraine, including attacks against its capital city, 
skills. This I was not expecting. And I was not expecting before because, frankly, I think it's beyond imagination what's going on. I personally believe it's a tragedy for Ukraine, but also, I also believe it's not really in the interest of Russia. Let me state that I have the highest respect for Russia as a country and for its people, for its courage, for its resilience over many centuries. I've said this very often to President Putin and to other very important leaders of, um, of Russia and to the world. Uh, Russia broad, broadly be belongs to the European civilization. It's in part very important in European history and civilization. Some of its great uh, citizens have given so much to European civilization in uh, uh, arts, in science, in culture. And also, I cannot forget that in fact it was many Russians, but also Ukrainians, that paid with their lives the resistance to Nazi Germany when Nazi Germany invaded uh, then Soviet Union. So I have the right, the, the great respect for Russia, historically, culturally, civilizationally. But frankly, I cannot understand why the biggest country in the world, because Russia is, geographically speaking, the biggest country in the world, is invading a smaller country. We are all committed to respect some principles, like the principles of sovereignty, national independence, and territorial integrity of countries. That's a basic principle of the United Nations. Of course, people can say that was not always respected. Others, including Western countries, probably have violated this principle before. But that should not be an argument. And that cannot be an argument for accepting now what we have criticized before. So this is why I frankly was not expecting this developments so dramatic, so tragic, and I hope that there will be sufficient wisdom, intelligence to um, restore peace as soon as possible. But also very sincerely, I am not very optimistic about the current situation, let me tell you very frankly. Mr. Varsha, thank you. I just realized I might be covering your video, so you can, I hope you can still see me. I'd like to stand. Yes. I just understood that I perhaps uh, uh, covered the screen, and I wanted to warn you, Mr. Barroso, um, uh, that you're able to uh, ask questions as well, as well as the viewers uh, uh, have an opportunity to ask Mr. Barroso about some, something and leave the uh, comments. Member states to the Russian war on Ukraine has been sort of unanimous. So, um, the, U the EU member states sh demonstrated a unified front, uh, rolled out unprecedented level of sanctions. Um, how sustainable do you think that united position is and uh, the newly found cohesiveness of the joint West? Look, uh, I, I was expecting that, frankly, because as you know, I've been leading the European Union, uh, the European Commission for 10 years. So I know how it works. It's true that European Union, sometimes it's difficult to take decisions, which is normal because we have uh, now 27 countries uh, that are independent countries. And you know, uh, foreign policy decisions and defense decisions are taken by unanimity. Mm -hmm. So by definition, if you have 27 or 28 countries, when I was there, we were 28 with the uh, United Kingdom, uh, when you have uh, 27 countries discussing very difficult matters, it's natural that it takes time and that there are divisions. Sometimes people, critics of the European Union, inside, I'm sorry, inside the European Union and also outside the European, sometimes they like to overestimate uh, those difficulties. But at the end, usually, the European Union takes decision by consensus. So I think that that was possible now. Why? because there was a big, a big revolt, there was a big uh, uh, unsatisfaction with the situation uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. And so I think that is very much supported by the public opinion in our countries. 
So the governments, in fact, had to follow the public opinion in Europe. Some of them probably were not uh, in those decisions. Uh, they would prefer at the beginning not to take those decisions because sanctions are always difficult because when we take the sanctions, we know that uh, sooner or later there will be counter sanctions. So this is not a very popular decision. The public opinion in Mediterranean countries from the Baltic countries to the West Atlantic countries. I mean, people understood that something had to be done. And that's why there are, in fact, when there is a conflict like this, there are three basic options, if you want. One is to do nothing, or just to make a, a diplomatic communique condemning the situation, to do nothing. To go on is if nothing had happened. That will be a possibility, but I don't think it will be a good possibility. Opportunity, a possibility if there is a country that has been invaded, some others could go and protect him, invade the other, and there will be a full blown war a war between the European Union and Russia, a war between NATO and Russia. That also we did not like consider. I think so. There is a third option was a sanctions to show. Uh, that uh, this action has a price that I believe that was adopted. Uh, answering directly your question, I believe the, the sanctions are going there to stay and there will be unity among European countries. One uh, thing I've learned in Europe is that sometimes it's very difficult to take decisions but it's even more dis difficult to change decisions once they are taken because of the process of decision making. So I think it will be sustainable over time, this position. Uh, Mr. Barroso, the reason why I'm asking about the sustainability is, of course, the energy dependency of Europe um, on Russia. And just to, to remind our viewers, uh, Russia supplies nearly 40% of uh, Europe's gas needs at the moment. And uh, yes, there is an, an effort to unwind this energy dependency on the, uh, in Europe. And as I think um, Mario Draghi is being very strategic about it. I think the Baltic states have, uh, have had a sort of abrupt ending of that dependency. Um, on the one hand, uh, Europe is trying to put economic pressures on Russia. On the other hand, that economic pressure is pretty constrained given the sort of energy dependency. What do you think about that? You know, I think, frankly, nowadays, the more important factors are political, not economic. Uh, of course, uh, of course, some countries of the European Union, not all, for instance, my country, Portugal or, or Spain, we import zero uh, gas from Russia, uh, but others import a lot. Uh, so, of course, it's more difficult for them to take that decision. Uh, but frankly, uh, once again, the public opinion is so strong uh, mm -hmm. condemning this invasion of Ukraine that there is a, a willingness to uh, um, go further. Um, and there are measures already taken uh, um, for more energy security of Europe. It will not be immediately, uh, but Europe has the means, the, for instance, a country like Germany uh, is uh, rich enough and technological uh, strong enough to build this uh, autonomy and uh, um, independence uh, in a relatively short period. Not tomorrow, not day after tomorrow, but it will do it. That is once one. Why I think this was a very bad decision for Russia to invade Ukraine. Because I personally am not at all happy with what we are seeing in terms of decoupling. I think it would be better to keep the world open for business, to keep our economies open and interconnected. But precisely because of what is happening now, the European countries and the European Union as such are preparing measures to reduce their exposure to uh, energy coming from Russia. Now, it's not going to be immediate, 
but it will happen. Uh, and uh, and it's, it will take some time, but it will happen. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Barroso, now Europe not only is um, supporting in terms of humanitarian aid, but in, ter in terms of condemning Russia for aggression, but also is supplying weapons and military defense uh, systems to Ukraine. And here I think NATO makes a distinction that sending uh, troops in you know, in direct combat is seen as engagement, whereas sending weapons is not seen as such. Do you think Moscow or Kremlin agrees with that, with that distinction? And if not, do you think they will retaliate? And Look, what's the risk of the conflict, you know, escalating further to NATO countries? I'm sure these decisions are not well seen or considered in Moscow, of course, but uh, let's be honest once again. There was an aggression, and the aggression was not uh, Ukraine invading Russia. It was Russia invading Ukraine uh, in its uh, uh, territory, as recognized by the United Nations and by Russia itself, because Russia has recognized the territorial integrity, the independence, and the sovereignty of Ukraine, mm -hmm. namely, uh, after the independence of Ukraine, when there was the agreements with the uh, Ukraine for depolarization of Ukraine. And by the way, Russia was even a guarantor of those agreements. So, uh, of course, once again, this is very unfortunate. We would all prefer that that did not happen. So, but in face of uh, the situation, when we have one country invading another one, one country that is the biggest country in the world, Russia is the biggest country in the world in territorial uh, extension. A country that has a strong, one of the strongest nuclear arsenal in the world. Invading a country that is much smaller, of course, NATO could uh, go there. By the way, president of, of, of Ukraine and Ukrainian authorities are asking for more action from NATO, including the so-called no-fly zone. Until now, the NATO leaders have been very clear they don't, don't want to engage in a, a direct confrontation with Russia, which I believe it's wise. But at the same time, they don't feel they can just watch what's going on. Because uh, this is something I would like uh, the participants of your Nobel Fest event to understand. This, in the public opinion of our countries, it's not only Poland or the Baltic countries or countries closer to Russia. In my country, it's Portugal, it's the western opposite side of Europe. Young people, everybody, from all political parties, from the left to the right, people that usually do not care about politics, they see those images in the television and they are very shocked. And that's why there is support in the public opinion of our countries, to do something. And to do something, something means, okay, we are not ready to go there for a war, but at least we should support those who are trying to defend themselves. I'm telling you very sincerely and very honestly, what is the perception of public opinion in uh, Europe, in Western Europe? And by the way, it's not only Western Europe. You saw the resolution in the United Nations 141 countries, including the poorer countries from Asia, from Africa, from Latin America, voted against Russia invasion of Ukraine. It was only four countries, four countries that supported the position of Russia. It was Belarus, it was uh, North Korea, it was Syria and Eritrea, only four countries. So this is not only, I want to make it clear, an issue about the so-called West and Russia. It's a situation that is shocking deeply the international community. Some of those countries are not um, ready to criticize Russia. They abstain, like China or India or others. They abstain because they still want to keep some kind of a neutral position, um, but uh, that does not mean they support the invasion. Of, of Ukraine. They, they even stated that they recognized the independence and sovereignty of Ukraine. So this is why you have to understand 
And I hope the public opinion in Russia understands how, how severely, how strongly people are judging this situation. And it will be great if we could put an end to it and work for peace as soon as possible. Ms. Verozzi, you mentioned about the United uh, Nations and recently during the United Nations um, votes for human rights count in the Human Rights Council, uh, China along with India did not support the resolution to suspend Russia from the UN Human Rights Council. Um, and we definitely see the uh, sort of the warming of the relations between um, Russia and China. If we were to see Russia expand more eastwards and become more aligned economically, financially and technologically with China, what are the long term and big implications geopolitically? What does it do for the world order? And let's, let, let me remind everyone that China is projected to become the world's largest economy by 2030. So it's hard to isolate a country like Russia, let's say, when your good neighbor and a good friend is the largest economy in the world. Yes, uh, but look, uh, once again, as some of you know, I'm, uh, I'm in favor of globalization for a purpose with good, good, good uh, let's say, with principles. I believe that we can love our countries to be patriotic. I am patriotic. I love my country. But at the same time, think about the good for mankind. I'm now sharing the Global Alliance for Vaccines. Um, and so I believe in some areas like... Uh, uh, global public health or the fight against climate change or, or even financial stability, uh, open and fair trade, fight against terrorism. I believe that uh, we should recognize that there are differences between our systems, for instance, between Europe and China, there are clearly very important differences, but we should work together. So I'm not happy at all when we see the world going for this kind of decoupling. Uh, when we see, uh, let's say, some talk about Cold War. I don't think it's good for the world. Having said that, uh, let's one see the problem. If uh, Russia becomes more and more close to China, but more dependent on China, because the economy of Russia and China was more or less the same 30 years ago. Now, uh, the economy of, of China is at least 10 times bigger than Russia. So once again, it's a big mistake for Russia what's happening because Russia will become much more dependent on one country with which they have borders. I know very well what Russians think about uh, this politics because I've spoken with them many, many times privately. It's not good for a country like Russia to be so dependent on China, not good. But also it's not good for the world, uh, a possibility of decoupling. For China, it's much more important, the Western markets, Europe is much more important than, than Russia, economically speaking. Russia, economically, is smaller than Italy. And now, because of the sanctions, will be smaller than Spain. And Russia, being the biggest country on Earth, and biggest one, being one of the countries that has more natural resources, not only fossil fuels, but com other commodities, should be much richer, should be much more developed economically and not have a relatively low GDP per capita as it has, lower than uh, European countries. So in fact, what's happening is a situation that is in the interest of nobody. Interest of, you know, in politics, sometimes people think what is good for me is bad for, for the others or what is good for the others is bad for me. It's wrong. Sometimes we are in situations where it's bad for everybody. It's bad for Russia to become more dependent for, of China. It's bad for China because China, if it becomes too close to Russia, there is a, a possibility of the so-called West becoming more and more distant from China. And China, that has, until now, has been the biggest winner of globalization because China has benefit, benefited from open markets globally, China will, of course, have some more problems with the West, with Europe and with the United States. 
And also, it's not good for Europe, because, of course, in Europe, we would like, first of all, to have stability. Nobody in Europe wants that situation. I mean, from, from the European Union, from Brussels to Paris to Berlin to uh, um, Stockholm to uh, Athens, nobody wants this situation to happen. And it was not our choice, this situation to happen. But the reality is that Europe depends a lot of exports as well. So this is also not good. So this is why it's a situation that is uh, not a win-win. It's a lose, lose, lose situation. If Moscow understands that it will be time to come to an agreement uh, with Ukraine and to stop this terrible war. Uh, Your Excellency, I'd like to, uh, this is just because we have an audience here in the region, um, many economies represented by I mean, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Uzbekistan here are pretty dependent and, uh, uh, on the economy of Russia, uh, the largest trade partner. How should the rest of us in the region engage with Russia at the moment like this? Well, how first of all, let me engage? send a message of friendship. First of all, let me send a message of friendship and respect to your countries. I've been many times in some of your countries, namely in Kazakhstan. I've been many times in Astana or Nur Sultan. And uh, I really respect your countries. And, and your countries are also some of them recently independent countries. So, so, so after the uh, end of the uh, Soviet Union. So I hope that uh, all you of you understand that it is also in your interest that uh, there are no aggressions of uh, uh, other countries, bigger countries. Of course, uh, I'm not at all saying that uh, you should uh, separate from Russia. On the contrary, I believe it's a separate, I mean, in terms of going against Russia, I understand very much, very well, that it is important stability in your region. So. Uh, personally, I think the ideal thing would be that, for instance, Ukraine uh, in the future keeps a good relationship with Russia once there is a peace, of course, not in the current situation, it's difficult. I understand that a country like Kazakhstan has to keep good relationship with Russia, but I hope that at least privately, at least privately, you are conveying the message to Moscow that this war should stop that it is not in your interest, this situation to go on, that this instability is bad for everyone, everyone also in, in your region. That's what I hope it will, it will happen and that we could create a new situation after this war of global security in Europe. Because I believe, of course, that these, these issues of security are important, but the, the way to, to ensure security in Europe is not by denying the right of other countries to be sovereign, independent, and to respect, and also not to respect their uh, territorial integrity. Mr. Barroso, is there any hope for a negotiated settlement or a brokered peace? And if that is to happen, how soon or later it may happen, in your view? And that uh, is one of the of questions we have from our viewers, online viewers. Uh, in my country, we say that uh, hope is the last thing to die. Uh, let's keep that hope. But I really believe uh, that uh, um, it's difficult now. There, there is a quote of Albert Einstein who said, peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved by understanding. By understanding. And I think, unfortunately, that now there is not sufficient understanding of the situation. So, um, I think there could be a hope for peace. Now, for instance, you would understand one thing. They can already claim, they said from the beginning, that one of their goals was to avoid Ukraine joining NATO. I don't think Ukraine is going to join NATO. Frankly, that issue was not in the agenda. Let me tell you very frankly, and I've been more than 23 years in meetings of NATO uh, as, a, as a member of my country uh, government and also as president of the European Commission. At that time, we were also participating in some of the meetings. There was no appetite.
for Ukraine to join NATO, from the NATO countries, I mean, because we understood that could be destabilizing. Of course, the principles of NATO are that uh, uh, we cannot say no to a country that wants to join, but uh, afterwards it requires unanimity to join NATO. So and there will be no unanimity for Ukraine to join NATO. Everybody knows that. In and you themselves. So, if the goal of uh, Mr. Putin and the goal of Russia was to avoid NATO, uh, I mean, to avoid Ukraine joining NATO, they could now perfectly say they have reached their goal and put an end to this war and afterwards to discuss some other specific issues. But at least to have a ceasefire and to put an end to this war. Because, by the way, uh, the Ukrainian government and authorities, they already said that they are ready to discuss it. So that will be, if there is sufficient willingness to peace, that could be a way for everyone to say, uh, as we usually say, to save face. I understand that uh, no one should be humiliated and to try to have a settled agreement for Ukraine and let's and go back to a situation of some stability. But frankly, when I see what is going on on the ground, I cannot be optimistic at this moment. So while I have not yet lost hope, the honest answer to your question is that I remain, unfortunately, quite skeptic about have, 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 having a solution for peace in the short term. Mr. Barroso, thank you very much. Yes, we have seen tremendous courage and heroism on the part of the Ukrainian people in the past weeks, and we hope that peace is restored in a country like Ukraine. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for your time. Thank you.